In cities around the world, hundreds of trains at any one time can be moving around the railway network. In remote places, it could be many miles between stations in areas with no people. In both these instances, the signallers who control the movements of the trains need to know where each and every train is at any given time. And it's more than just ensuring they're running on time. Let's have a quick look at why this is. A key principle in railway signalling is that the track ahead of any given train needs to be clear for it to proceed forward. In fact, it needs to be proved to be clear before signalling systems will allow a green proceed signal to be shown to a train. This is one of the main ways train collisions are prevented, essentially by keeping trains apart. This then makes it necessary to have a way to detect if a train is present on a part of the track. Therefore, we have train detection. So let's look at how it works. Firstly, I will say that there are newer systems that are based around maintaining the distance between trains through what is known as moving blocks, which are around the trains themselves. This is known as the European Rail Traffic Management System, or ERMTMS. In this video, I'm going to focus on the fixed block signalling systems, which are currently installed on the vast majority of UK railways and others around the world. As the name suggests, the basis of this type of train detection is splitting the railway up into fixed blocks. These are known as sections. These sections can vary in length depending on a number of factors such as track layout, train service patterns and geography. However, they are governed by railway standards around the minimum length and design criteria, with the focus on keeping trains apart. Apart from some specific areas, such as terminal stations or sidings, where alternative methods of working may be in place, the overriding principle is within each block there can only be one train at a time. So, we have our block and the understanding that there should only be one train in it at any time to safely keep trains apart. But how is the presence of a train within the block actually detected? This is where the train detection comes in. There are two main train detection systems in common usage today, track circuits and axle counters. There are some older systems, such as token systems, which might still be around a bit, but I'll not be covering them in this video. While both track circuits and axle counters perform the same function, they go about it in a very different way, each with its own pros and cons. So let's start with track circuits. Track circuits are fundamentally electrical circuits, utilising the rails to link a power source at one end and a relay connected to the signal at the other. Each track circuit section is isolated by insulated block joints, commonly known as IBJs, although you may see them also called insulated rail joints or IRJs. When no train is in the section, the current passes through the relay to complete the circuit. This then shows the track circuit is clear on both the signal and the signalling panel, allowing a green aspect to be shown to the train and for the train to proceed into that section of track. However, when a train enters the section, the axle allows the current to bypass the relay when completing the circuit. When the relay isn't getting a supply of the current, it then indicates that the track circuit is occupied within the signalling system. The signaller will see this section of track occupied on his panel, a red signal aspect will be shown at the signal at the start of the block, and a train will not be able to enter that section of track. So now we know how they work, let's look at the good things about track circuits. I will admit that the list of advantages track circuits have over other detection systems is a bit short. So, they are a proven and understood system that works. In certain circumstances, track circuits can detect broken rails. If a brake is clean and gives a gap that disrupts the flow of the current, the track circuit will show occupied. But this is not their primary role, and broken rails can occur and the track circuit still function due to the brake characteristics or the bonding in place or other factors. If they are reset or fail, they indicate the presence of the train straight away if it's in its section. As you'll see, this is not the case for axle counters. So that's the good things about track circuits. Let's look at some of the drawbacks and common issues that affect them. I will warn you, this is a bit of a longer list. Given the fact that a track circuit requires the flow of electricity to work properly, anything that affects this can cause issues. Normally this is in the form of a short circuit, stopping the relay getting the current, but without a train axle being present. This in turn can cause the track circuit to show that there is a train present when there isn't. This is known as showing occupied whilst clear. As you can imagine, with the railway being exposed to all the elements all the time, as well as being part of a functional railway, the ways that the flow of electricity can be interrupted are vast. Common issues are metal debris causing a short circuit to another component. This can range from a railway component, such as a clip, to a can that's been thrown onto the track by a passenger waiting for a train. Wet ballast, whether from rain, the inside of a tunnel, a track fault or frost, standing water, or flooding can also give the route for electricity to short out. 
Closer inspection of railway components will show multiple instances where insulation is designed in to prevent the shorts of track circuits. Pads, materials selected for the use of sleepers and ferrules are all examples of this. For the electrical current to pass between the rail and the train wheel, which is required for the correct function of the track circuit, the contact has to be good. Anything that gets between the rail and the wheel is known as railhead contamination. Rust on the rails from a long period of disuse or the pulp created from fallen leaves are two common examples of contaminants on the railhead that can cause issues with the passage of the current. This can cause a train not to be detected by the signalling system, therefore showing the track as clear when a train is in fact present. This then brings us on to what can be seen as the biggest drawback to track circuits. That is the requirements to have joints in the track. These insulated block joints, or IBJs, separate the different track sections and insulate them from one another. Between the rail ends of the joint is a piece of insulation, known as the T-piece. These joints create another opportunity for the electrical current to be interrupted. Swarf, created from maintenance works or the passage of trains, can get into the joints. If the joints are voiding or dipped, the ends can become battered and lip over. Both of these allow the insulation to be bridged, allowing the current to pass between track circuit sections, causing the system to fail. This can also occur if other parts of the insulation are damaged. Expansion of the rails in the summer, which compresses the insulating T-piece, makes this failure type even more common, as the gap to be bridged is shorter. The IBJs create gaps in the rail, making them weak points. Consequently, these joints are prone to dipping or deflecting under passing trains, leading to track geometry faults. This can also cause damage to the rail ends and the formation of rail defects. Additionally, the plates used to form the joints can crack under the load of passing trains. Now, I should say there are jointless track circuits where different audio frequencies are used for each section. Areas known as tuning zones are created between the track circuits. This track circuit type, developed when continuously welded rails started to be used, removes the IBJs along with their vulnerabilities and maintenance requirements. They may be more common on high-speed track, but conventional track circuits, with their IBJs, are still very common. As you can see, track circuits are vulnerable to fail from a number of sources, but particularly environmental ones. They also introduce, via the IBJs, a weakness into the rail. So while a proven method of detection, they are sensitive and vulnerable. Now, let's look at the other main type of train detection, axle counters. As the name suggests, axle counters use a count of the number of axles to determine if a section of track is clear or not. Train axles are counted into the track section as the train enters, and then out again as the train leaves. When the numbers balance, i.e. the number of axles that entered the section have left the section, the section is shown as clear. The counting is undertaken by axle counter heads that are attached to the rail. Unlike IBJs, they are not integral to the rail, so do not weaken it. Axle counters come with a number of advantages, which probably explains why they are now preferred over track circuits when possible. They have no issues with electrical current flowing through the rails, so all of those issues with the short circuits we went through for track circuits do not apply to axle counters. This means they can even function, in theory, with the track underwater. There are no joints in the track that require maintenance or could develop defects and issues. They can also be used as a method of additional protection for maintenance staff in line blockages through what is known as engineering possession reminders, or EPR. But there are some drawbacks to axle counters. Firstly, if they do fail and have to be reset, such as when there's a power failure, the system loses its count. For safety reasons, this means when it does come back online, it will show all the sections as occupied. The sections then need to be proved to be clear before normal operation can be resumed. Another issue that can occur is when a wheel stops directly above an axle counter sensor. This can cause what is known as wheel rock, where the axle is incorrectly counted out of the previous section, leaving it showing occupied. This is a particular issue in stations where multiple trains may be stabled or stop in a single platform. Lastly, a common way track staff stop trains in the case of an emergency in track circuited areas is to install what's called a track circuit operating clip across the two rails. This will show the track circuit is occupied, thus stopping trains. But this cannot be done in axle counted areas, so other methods such as contacting the signaller need to be used to stop and protect trains in the event of an issue. So now you know that train detection allows the lines to be proved clear, which in turn allows the safe passage of trains. In fixed block systems, there are two main types in common usage, track circuits and axle counters. As you've seen, both systems have their pros and cons that make them suitable for use in different and certain areas. 
So I hope you found this video useful. If you want to know about railway engineering, a great place to start is with our range of ebooks that are available in the links in the description below. If you want a little added extra, by signing up to our email list at the link below, you'll get our free Guides Can ebook straight into your email inbox. Drop any comments or queries below, hit that like button and subscribe so you don't miss a single video. Thank you.